We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello out there in uh, archaeology podcast land. This is Dr. Alan Garfinkel. I'm the president and founder of the California Rock Art Foundation. And what we do is we identify, evaluate, manage, and conserve rock art both in Alta, California and in Baja, California. We conduct field trips. We have trainings, exercise. We do research. And in every way possible, we try to preserve, protect, and coordinate treasures of Alta and Baja California rock art, of which there are many and diverse. We also work closely with Native Americans and uh, partner with them to recognize and protect sacred sites. So for more info about the fabulous California Rock Art Foundation, you can go to carockart.org. Also, I'm, I'm open to give me a call, 805-312-2261. We would uh, welcome sponsorship or underwriting, uh, helping us to defray the costs of our podcasts. And also membership in California Rock Art Foundation. And of course, donations since we are a 501c3 nonprofit scientific and educational corporation. God bless everyone out there in podcast land. You're listening to the Rock Art Podcast. Join us every week for fascinating tales of rock art, adventure, and archaeology. Find our contact info in the show notes and send us your suggestions. Hello out there in podcast land. This is your host, Dr. Alan Garfinkel. And on this episode, episode 35, Chris Webster and I are going to banter back and forth about the projectile pointed people of the Coso range and the presence of projectile points in rock art and what that means. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Rock Art Podcast. I am your host one more time, which means I'm interviewing Alan about one of the many things he knows about. <laughs> God, bl- God bless you, Chris Webster. That's, a, that's, the, that's the greatest introduction I've ever had. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That, uh, that's all we need, really. That's really all we need. No, so, that's it. That's it. Yeah. I mean, let's start, uh, let's start by just, you know, kind of catching up here. We're in the middle of April as we're recording this, 2021. Yep. How's it going for you? How's your, how's your field season shaping up? No, it's good. It's good. I, I have uh, a lot of work. It's it's really surprising. You'd think in the midst of this uh, debacle that we're facing with the coronavirus, that mm-hmm. the work the work would have dried up to some extent or been more highly competitive. But I've never been busier in my life, and there's so much work and at so many different levels that I'm engaged in. I do a lot of uh, CRM work, both for several mm-hmm. different employers and have uh, major contracts. And then uh, my research as well. So, as I've said before, I feel like a one-armed paper hanger. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, it is a little bit crazy. Uh, I think we're making up for lost time last year, right? And people are people are getting back out there and doing what they're doing. It'll be interesting to see how things go because we have new coronavirus variants that are starting to yes. take a foothold. And I've heard of some states and areas rolling back lockdown procedures. We'll see how that affects us all in the next couple of months. We, where are you, uh, uh, you know, right now? Where is Chris Webster in the world right now? <laughs> so interestingly, anthropologically speaking, we are in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, which is right about oh in the word. middle of Pennsylvania. Yeah, we're about uh-huh. um, 30 minutes I guess, southwest of Reading. And yeah. we are right in the heart of Amish country. That's so it's, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting seeing the the mix of people in these small little villages, towns, areas out here. The rolling countryside is absolutely beautiful out here. I could easily live in this area. It's, it's just absolutely beautiful out here. The houses, the history, the landscape, everything is just, is just it's really exquis- beautiful. It's so. exquisite, isn't it? It's really yeah, captivating. It really is. Um, it's been used for a lot of uh, cinematography over the years. And oh, I'm sure. Always, yeah. uh, always, always intriguing. But yeah. uh, ret- returning to the uh, <laughs> the world of, of rock art and archaeology and indigenous uh, worldview and cosmology, all the above, there's a topic that's been near and dear to my heart for, I would say, over 40 years. Mm-hmm. 
I left archaeology for about a decade or two, and I came back, and the one thing that kept stuck with me about my research area, which was in the Coso Range of Eastern California, was uh, the book written by Campbell Grant and his colleagues back in 1968. They had mm-hmm. a picture and a couple of paragraphs about the projectile points, the arrow points, the dart points that were depicted in the rock art imagery of the Coso Range, mm-hmm. their rock drawings. And they appeared to me to be so realistic or so well defined that one could at some point argue as to as to what their morphology, their typology, what kind of points were represented. And if we could say mm-hmm. what kind of points they were, we might be able to date the rock art based on the subject matter. I know we've talked that about sense. that before, haven't we? Yeah. So yeah. when I got back into this, what I did was I revisited the subject. I went out with uh, one of the grand masters of the Coso range, Ken Pringle, who's now passed away. Mm-hmm. He was one of the one of the original authors of the Rock Art of the Coso Range volume. Uh, senior author was Campbell Grant, and um, he led me on an expedition. So we visited all of those point places where where that uh, Campbell Grant had alluded to the fact that there were these projectile point images on the rocks, and so I photographed them and did a deep dive into their mysteries and wrote an article with Ken Pringle mm-hmm. and published it in the Rock Art Research, the Herrera volume, American Rock Art Research Association. And of course, I got their dating wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was completely in error in terms of what I said about the age of those points because mm-hmm. I, I had thought that they were arrow points and not dart points. And I thought because they were so ubiquitous and found in certain areas, that was their ages. And I also sort of did the dimensions and attributes and morphology of those points. And it all seemed to make perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Well, what I, what I had missed is there are doppelgangers. There are identical point forms, one a dart and the other an arrow. So if you look at a rose spring or an Eastgate point, and if you look at an Elko eared or Elko corner notch point, the only difference between them is their size. Because right. all the other dim- dimensions, the basal indentation ratio, the distal shoulder angle, the proximal shoulder angle, everything else would be the same. So right. what I couldn't tell based on those images on the rocks was whether they were arrow points or dart points. Well, fast forward to a more deep and abiding study using portable X-ray fluorescence dating and also examining the superimposition of those points on the rocks and with, with the associations they had with other imagery, I felt eventually the dates on those points direct dates on those images themselves were consistently about in the neighborhood of 26 or 2700 years old. So that would certainly Hmm. push them back uh, to precede the introduction of the bow and arrow, which was only about 2000 years old. So these points appeared to be depictions of either what might be called Elko, Elko series, Elko meaning where they had originally been developed in Elko, Nevada. And right. they were all corner notched and uh, eared forms. And occasionally they were simply basal notched forms that were large and that would have been contemporaneous form called Humboldt's. Humboldt basal notched bifaces, as I love to call them. Okay. After I published that, the, the first thing I did was spend another two or three years figuring out the ages of my Humboldt basal notch bifaces <laughs> and publishing a, a paper on that. And that's a whole other story unto itself. But these realistic renderings of projectile points are not as unusual as we, we would have thought. There is one out there in Nevada 
on a, uh, in several actually, and they're not that uncommon. And there are some that are painted, and they're very uh, common in South Texas. They're called Shumla, S-H-U-M-L-A, South Texas, amongst the Pecos tradition. And there the projectile points appear as though they're uh, people. <laughs> they, they make the points appear as, as anthropomorphic beings. So the point forms and, and the human figures are int- intricately connected. Interesting, right. huh? Yeah, let me let me let me ask you a question real quick here. So the yeah, yeah, um, please. so the skeptic in me, yeah, the skeptic in me and the archaeologist in me says, well, when I'm walking through the desert in Nevada or Utah or the Eastern Mojave or something like that, I can find projectile points and other artifacts that have been sitting on the ground for ten thousand years, right? It's just in in some cases where there's a little soil yes. development. Yes, that is R- absolutely rarely, the case. Rarely, but so yes, exactly. So. How do we know conclusively, or at least to a point where you're comfortable enough publishing this and saying, yes, this is uh, this is what's going on, that the projectile points that are illustrated on the rock walls are dated to the same time period as the people who made the illustrations? Uh, I'm just wondering if they no, we really, found we really, other things a, on the good, landscape. That's a good question, and we certainly don't. Right. We would have to argue somewhat persuasively that as we see depicted on the rocks, the use of bows and arrows. Mm -hmm. And when we see depicted on the rocks, the use of otlottles or spear throwers, Mm -hmm. if those kinds of images are also then contemporaneous with certain other cultural expressions, or if we have other independent evidence to lock in those particular timeframes. And if we found coincidentally point forms that look like and represent and appear to be very, very similar, if not identical, to the way in which these are represented. Mm -hmm. Then if we look broader and find that this is not just a representation in one geographical area, but it's in multiple geographical areas and appears to be a characteristic of a particular time in prehistory, where hunting and hunting ideology seem to have been especially dominant. How's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess the one thing that we can say for sure without without a doubt is the people who made the petroglyphs, 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 whatever you have, were present when the things they drew existed. (laughs) That's... Yes. So if we could ever... Right. Yeah, so we are directly dated. It's also very likely if we directly date them and we get those ages which we've done with portable X-ray fluorescence a couple of different times now. We've had, uh, Mm -hmm. back in 2008, we pioneered work with Farrell Lytle, who is a world-class researcher who did some of the most, uh, you know, sort of initial examination of using X-ray fluorescence on things like dating uh, the desert varnish on Mars and other things like that. He worked with me on dating the Koso rock art images and did an extensive study with, you know, I don't know, 50, 100 or more readings all over the Koso range specifically. And the, the dates that he, he got after much analysis and rigor were reasonable. They were not extraordinarily old right. or extraordinarily young. And we published, didn't publish, we had a paper that we gave at the Great Basin Anthropological Conference that I was a, an author on. And that's where it's it stood for, I would say, what, maybe a decade or more. Mm-hmm. And then another re- researcher approached me who had done the same kind of research and published it extensively in peer-reviewed journals. And he worked mainly in the Middle East. And he was um, a researcher from uh, Germany. Okay. And he said, Alan, I want to try to date the Koso rock art. And I said, okay. So we went out to Little Lake and also out to some other locations. And characteristically, 
did the same thing with the portable XRF machine, but using a little bit of a different model, slightly, and a more sophisticated model that had previously been tested all over the Middle East based on the known ages of the rock art. There they have actual writing on the images, mm -hmm. and the subject matter is so well testified ah. when you've got chariots, <laughs> when you have, you know, Middle Eastern Hebrew or Aramaic writing. Yeah. And then you have the agrarian elements where you can see certain other elements included. You have, you can bracket the imagery broadly into the various periods that they have for their old world chronology. And he did that. He yeah. did the same thing with Koso, but examined the oldest images that are completely revarnished and also okay. dated the most recent images that are, are very fresh and that are rather than being rock drawings, they're milling slicks that in some instances are superimposed over the images of the older rock drawings. Hmm. So we, we had a, a 10,000 year um, sort of a set sense of a chronology, a yardstick to work from. And okay. he then had quite a bit of, of other uh, alternative and independent elements to examine. Hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds like a good spot to uh, to take our first break because that does make sense. And uh, I've got a few questions around that. And we'll pick that up on the <laughs> other side of the break. Back in a minute. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Webster. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to zencastr.com and use the code rockart looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field then check out an introduction to paleo radiography a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines created by archaeologist radiographer and lecturer james elliott the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education it is approved by the chartered institute for archaeologists as four hours of training that's in the uk for those of you that don't know so don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development for more information on pricing and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. All right, welcome back to episode 35 of the Rock Art Podcast. And I'm here talking to Alan about... Rock drawings of the Coso range and the, the pointed petroglyphs, the uh, dart points that are depicted throughout the uh, yeah. Coso range and around the world for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. And that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you was actually relating to age. Now, looking at just the, I guess, just the projectile points, because in some cases, as you've already mentioned, I mean, dating actual rock art is pretty tough. But when we look at just the imagery and the stuff that's represented, how far back do you know, or can you even tell me right now, the do these projectile points go? Like, how far back? Well, you know, we have examples of dart points and projectile point forms that go all the way back to Paleo-Indian times. And there has been some articles written about uh, imagery that they think is rock drawings that represent fluted points. So we've got, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13,000 years worth of prehistory. But it appears to me that the heyday, the peak period of production, PPP, for these weapons was in what we call the Middle Archaic from about 2000 BC mm -hmm. or thereabouts, uh, maybe a bit earlier as well, to about uh, AD 1. So I'd say two to 4,000 years ago was a period of time, for whatever reason, 
that there seemed to be a great emphasis on hunting technology and the religious metaphor or the the representation of these weapons in rock art. And it, and it is in paintings and it also is in rock drawings. And what they're depicting is either a large corner-notched dart point or a large basally notched, non-corner-notched, just shouldered yeah. item. Mo- most of them are of this corner-notched Elko series projectile point. And I think that's okay. really what we're looking at. When we did the study with uh, Feral Lytle, we had three different direct dates and they all came out virtually the same. They were 28, 27, and 2600 years old. And they were done in different locations mm-hmm. in the Coso range, which is quite interesting unto itself. Now, besides which, what also seems to be interesting is these points are not only shown alone or in solitary way as mm-hmm. projectile points, but they adorn or embellish either solid bodied or decorated bodied animal human figures. So what do I mean by that? Well, okay. they're, they're, they're either, they're, they're creatures that have uh, avian feet, bird feet, and uh, have decorated torsos. And they um, often have uh, plumage on their heads, feathers, <laughs> and their <laughs> quail plumes. So okay. this is all quite interesting, right, Alan? So what does all of this mean? <laughs> now, the, the, the odd thing about this that was puzzling to me and, and sort of was a, a game stopper, I said, why do they have projectile points and these huge points, these, some of the points are, are three feet tall. <laughs> so wow. yeah. they're, really, they're really working at it, right? Yeah. And so these are, these are on the shoulders or on the heads or on the torsos of these figures, right? Well, I, uh, I have a um, PhD student who fortunately obtained her PhD not too long ago. And mm-hmm. she and I had an opportunity to spend several months free all looking at these sorts of things and studying them. And she spent a couple years analyzing it. And even fortunately, even to a greater extent, another researcher published a book that had 450 individual images of these kinds of decorated animal human figures. And what we found when we began to look at them very closely is that most of them are women. They have female genitalia, and they have the actual anatomical elements. They call it a visual shorthand for showing that they're females. How's that? Which which didn't make any sense Mm -hmm. to me. Why would you have the weaponry that are used by men in hunting intimately associated in adorning a female? Right. Unless the females were making the points. Right. So as I came to find out after, you know, I, I I do this, I obsess over something and think about it for years and years and read everything (laughs) I can find on it and then continue to drill down until I feel I have a reasonable, logical, substantive and persuasive answer. So as I began to study this and reflect on it, I uh, ended up looking at the uh, symbolism, the deep and abiding symbolism of folks that are called Uto Aztecans. And these Mm -hmm. are, this is a linguistic group that uh, is one of the largest ones, certainly in the Americas, that also represents a large Mm -hmm. swath of the native California population. Also a, linguistic isolate in the American Southwest and many cultures in Mesoamerica. And as I began to study Udo Aztecan and also look even globally worldwide about the way in which certain 
I call them super mundane beings, supernaturals, right. de deities, whatever you want to call them, gods and goddesses, that uh, an earth mother goddess or a goddess of the hunt or the master of the animals mm -hmm. is depicted worldwide mainly as a female and also with weaponry, the weaponry of the hunt. And that's mm. rather interesting. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, it's sort of an oxymoron to me. I'd say it was almost paradoxical that you would see these weapons that are consistently associated with men with a female. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have to sort of think about things right. yeah. in a totally different way. Go ahead. Yeah. It just alludes to the fact that, you know, we know very little about past societies and how they saw the world and their, their relationships and interactions with each exactly. other. Right. You know what, right. How were they, we have modern concepts of how we divide labor and how even ethnographically, you know, a couple hundred years ago, division of labor and things like that took place. But that's not to say it's been the same way across the planet for 10,000 years. So exactly. You know? But, at, but as we drill down and examine cross culturally, ethnographically hunters and gatherers, foragers, and even, uh, you know, sort of incipient cultivators mm -hmm. and examine their cosmology, their religious metaphor, you know, what we find, we find commonalities. We find hmm. particular patterns that allow us to maybe probe or deconstruct uh, a bit about the images we're seeing and maybe glean a, a teeny bit of understanding. How's that? Right, right. That makes sense. I'm curious as to the imagery of the points real quick. I, were they detailed or are they are they basically outlines? You know, like when, when an archaeologist sketches a projectile point, we put a lot of different details in it. And that's how right. the first thing that's in my mind. But how how detailed are these things? Outline shapes? Do they have any sort of features, you know? Yes. So they're showing the tangs. They're showing mm -hmm. the basal indentation. And they're showing the overall form and morphology. And when you have something that's three feet tall, you can really kind of get a feeling for what the thing <laughs> looks like. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Yeah. So, and when they make these pictures, these huge pictures like this, yeah, they are adorning or associating these points with solid bodied and decorated figures that are often mm -hmm. explicitly female. And okay. they're also associated with serpents. Hmm. They always have either serpents by them, big, huge, tall snakes, or the other thing that I learned actually from an artist, since I didn't really recognize this mm -hmm. before, is that the actual decorative motifs within the torsos of these beings are actually replicating the body designs of the, of the snakes themselves. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so we've got uh, the rattlesnake, the Western Pacific rattlesnake, and we also have the gopher snake. Now what's interesting is that one of the indigenous groups that lived and, and still lives in this Koso region actually have names for these designs as they put them on baskets. They embellish mm -hmm. their baskets with these designs. And as an element, as an infix, as a morpheme, as a word within that design description is the word for rattlesnake or gopher snake. Okay. So we know that that's what they're saying. They're saying this design is a design of a rattlesnake. This is a design of a gopher snake. Okay. Well, that is super interesting. Let's go ahead and take our final break real quick and come back and wrap this up and see what it all means in the, in the grand scheme of things. We will be back with episode 35 in just a moment. 
You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our tea Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. All right, welcome back to the Rock Art Podcast, episode 35. This is our final segment. And Alan, what does it all mean? What were these people thinking? What were they doing? How do we do, how do we deal with this? Well, I, I can I can answer this with with great confidence since I've spent a good forty or even longer years sort of studying this kind of thing uh, cross culturally throughout the world and also fun you know looking very deeply into ancient Uto Aztec and archaic cosmology. What we're looking at here is the concept of death and rebirth, renewal and regeneration. It's, this, it's, it's basically looking at the earth, the plants and the animals, and the cycle of life. It's, it's about mm-hmm. fertility and fecundity. It's about metamorphosis. It's a prayer for continued bounty of sufficient rain and sun for the harvest of plants and animals and for the ability of the particular indigenous people to survive and, and, uh, and grow. And for the... Yeah key elements of their cosmology, the sky, the clouds, the sun, the moon, the constellations of the stars and planets, to continue in this vein. These are, these were major mm-hmm. figures to them that when they passed by, they knew exactly what their names were and what the concept of life and metaphor were communicating to them. And, and this hmm. is uh, something that it takes a while to figure out because it is so far afield and so different from from kind of the western industrial understanding of life how's that right yeah it is definitely very different that's for sure but that being said when one looks at some of the the more preserved or ancient religious cultures mm-hmm. for instance looking at the weechel of Southern Texas and Northern Mexico and their, their preservation of the mythology, the oral traditions, the creation stories, their clues to an understanding of this ancient Udo Aztecan metaphor. Also, if we think about this in the sense of looking at what the Aztecs may have known and thought about and talked about in their codices. And also Mm -hmm. for me, being a Catholic, there's surprisingly a lot of ancient metaphor embedded in the ritual, ceremony, and dogma of the Catholic Church, be it regeneration, be it coming of age rites, be it uh, transformation, resurrection, uh, all of those elements are part and parcel, uh, even even sacrifice or ritual or, or other things, uh, you know, surviving that have distant metaphors, similarities to the ancient cosmology of people thousands of years ago. If you think about it, the Catholic tradition is 2000 years old. Right. And it's been going on almost uh, unchanged for that entire period of time. And so, one can see in those rituals, in those ceremonies, in those religious philosophies and metaphors, sometimes you you get a glimpse or a glimmer, just a peek at some of the thought process, processes of ancient people. It has to do with animism. It has to do with uh, transformation. It has to do with death and rebirth. All mm-hmm. those things all mixed together. As an example... 2,000 years ago, when the Catholics were praying, they would embellish these uh, ritual objects with figures that had raised arms to the sky. And what they were praying Mm -hmm. was to the saints to be intercessors, basically, you know, intermediaries to help bring their prayers to God and have them answered. Does that seem like anything similar to what we're talking about here? Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Because we're talking about 
these beings that are either deities or guardian spirits or helping spirits that in turn embody certain key metaphoric vessels or elements that capture the yearnings or the desires of humankind for longevity, for health, for peace, et cetera, et cetera. Does any of this make any sense? It does, you know, and it goes to show you that uh, we have to study many different fields and disciplines in order to to understand certain things. I'm not Catholic by any means. Uh, I'm not even really all that religious, to be honest. And I realized, though, that just like a place name study, we use place name studies a lot when we're looking at either old maps before we changed them to, you know, Western names. People who would draw maps back 100, 150, 200 years ago in the United States would put on the names of places that they were told from the Native Americans and and places around there. And we can learn a lot from those old names. Well, similarly, we can take a look at a religion. Like you said, Catholicism is, you know, 2000 years old, realistically, and has changed little. Well, we can learn a lot about people 2000 years ago and through time and conversely using Native American religion and studying current religious practices and spiritual practices can know a lot about the people, you know, 500, 1000, maybe even 5000 years ago or more with these religions. And we can and we just have to use all the pieces of data that we have, you know, uh, at our disposal to help understand these these things we don't currently understand. So I really like that. Yeah, yeah. And we have to open our minds. We've got to be open yeah. to other possibilities. And we have to learn to uh, deconstruct the visual shorthand of rock art that in some cases, yeah. not always, but in some cases, right. may memorialize creation stories or mm-hmm. key signatures, hallmarks of their religion. For instance, what does a rattlesnake mean? What does a, a, a thunderbird mean? What does a butterfly mean? So mm-hmm. all of these are, you know, how we talk about memes today, all these memes. Right. What are memes? <laughs> You're, the, you're Mr. Technology. What are memes? Well, memes in today's uh, today's landscape are images or words or things that represent some sort of cultural phenomenon taking place today. And we pass these around and we laugh at them. That's basically what memes are today. But, you know, memes anthropologically are ideas, right? Cultural ideas that are transmitted between people and cultures and uh, and other groups. And they're, and they're packages of ideas that immediately can be communicated. You're seeing a symbol, yeah. but you immediately know what the person <laughs> sending that symbol is attempting to communicate. That's right. And there's no words on it. It's, it's a picture. It's a, it's a funny picture. It's a funny set of images. But immediately it, it emotes. How's that? It, it causes mm-hmm. one to have an emotional association with that image. Right. Rock art is much the same in being a visual medium that is meant to, in some cases, to emote, create either, what would you call it? Um, Create a a sense of transcendence. How's that? A sense Mm -hmm. of sort of a connection with the higher power or fear, joy, happiness, love, uh, Humor, all those things mm-hmm. all all wrapped up together. Right. Yeah. There was okay. a study, a scientific study done, where they hired a bunch of actors and actresses who replicated the postures of certain key three-dimensional 30, 40, 50,000-year-old images like the, um, the Lion Man and some of these uh, Venus figurines. Mm-hmm. And then they they asked the actors and actresses to hold those postures and clear their minds and then tell them what their feelings were. And the feelings were either joy or sorrow or strength or love or what have you. And so even just by looking at a figure who has a certain set of gestures or postures, sometimes we can elicit the potential meaning of those 
forms of that morphology. Right. Okay. Well, uh, this has certainly been, I think, uh, I think a great introduction to this topic, and I'm sure there is much more that can be learned from, again, studying these various disciplines and and bringing it all back to rock art. One question that is a little bit probably off base, yeah. but I've been thinking about it since we started this segment was, mm -hmm. I guess this would vary regionally, of course, and, and I'm just speaking of, let's just say North America or the United States, because that's where we're at right now. But when do we think or what do we think caused Native peoples to stop making rock art? I've, he I've heard of people going out and, you know, re regaining their roots and, and starting to do some of this stuff again, although that gets problematic because you want to go out to places that are, you know, that are well known that you that your ancestors went to. But now they're protected and, you know, there's issues around that. But at some point, it seems like most Native groups stopped making new rock art, or at least, I don't know if they stopped visiting those sites, but but there seems to be an end point. Do we have any ideas around that? Well, I wrote an article and published it, okay? Of course you did. And <laughs> I think I called it, I don't know, resource intensification or whatever. There was something going on there. But mm -hmm. as a reminder of this, and I think I've mentioned this before on some of the other episodes that we had, that there seems to be an elicitation and a manifestation of people's emotions when they're going through problematic periods. Yeah. It seems as though they, they, they go back to church. They go back, like there's no, there's no, uh, atheists in, on the, on the pipeline, right? When you're in the battle <laughs> zone. In right. the trenches, right? Because then they're then they bend down and pray and hoping to get their butt saved. The same thing happened in nine eleven, right? Mm -hmm. What what happened in nine eleven? Everyone runs to church, but then they all gather up flags, and they ran out of flags because these were symbolic of our nation and our our signature hallmark, uh, you know, meme, if it were. Well, the same thing happened with Native people. When they went through hell in the 1870s through the mm -hmm. 1890s, where their populations were decimated, right, from the exotic disease, mm -hmm. and their subsistence basis was destroyed because of the mining that was going on and the unrelenting hunting what happened? This is at historic times, right? Mind you. Right. They went back and started doing rock art in a big way. <laughs> mm. And they Makes were sense. and they were painting multicolored, elaborate imagery representing their worldview and their cosmology and how they had hoped the world would be recreated in a way that would bless them. It was called the ghost dance. Right. And during this ghost dance period, they prayed and hoped that there would be an ending to the occupation of the Euro-Americans, mm -hmm. that they that a new world would ensue and overtake and replace the world of the Euro-Americans, and it would bring back the dead, it would bring back the natural world and the and the animals and the plants that were being destroyed and the rivers and the landscape, and it would go back to a better world. Well, that was painted on the rocks by native people in the historic era. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. And we've, we've definitely talked about ghost dance and I've heard you lecture about ghost dance as well. And we need to probably have an episode that, that really, tackles that. I don't know if we've had a specific episode I don't where think we've so. actually talked about that. Yeah. I just remember you talking about it because I've heard you speak about it before and it's a fascinating topic. So um, that maybe that'll be on a, a on a future episode where we do another one like this. So to wrap up this one, any final thoughts uh, on this topic before we, before we sign off? I think it, it's good to see with other eyes. I, one can only see what one expects to see. And so I think... Um, we need to understand well, that we, we, we have to dismantle our structure of knowing and, yeah. and hope to reveal 
sometimes the the things that we're not looking for. We can only see what we can look what we expect to see. And so right. when I when I've uh, done that and uh, examine things from other perspectives, it's amazing what you end up discovering. Indeed. Well, on that note, then we will end this episode so you can go discover more. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Chris. You like that. (laughs) What a blessing you are. God bless you. Indeed. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Alan. Thanks everybody for listening. And uh, we will be back next time with another great episode. In the meantime, this is episode 35. If you're just finding us, go check out the back catalog. We've got 34 other episodes that uh, just, if you've got a passion for rock art, go listen to them because we cover lots of different topics on those shows related all around to rock art. So check that out. And if you want to support us, head over to arcpodnet.com forward slash members. And of course, check the links in the show notes for the California Rock Art Foundation where you can support them and their efforts as well. Thanks a lot, Alan. And thanks everybody for listening. See you next week. Thanks for listening to the Rock Art Podcast with Dr. Alan Garfinkel and Chris Webster. You can find this podcast on the educational podcast app Lyceum, L-Y-C-E-U-M, and wherever you find podcasts. Find show notes and contact information at www.arcpodnet.com forward slash rock art. Thanks for listening, and thanks for sharing this podcast with your family and friends. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.